All right, today we're going to talk about torque. Specifically, what happens when you put a current carrying wire loop in an external magnetic field. And the way we're going to set this up is uh, let's say that this is a region of magnetic field here, constant, uniform magnetic field. And we have a loop of wire that's set up in, inside the magnetic field. Let's draw it as a rectangular, rectangular loop there. And this loop has some dimensions. Let's say this side is A and this side is B. And we set up a current in this loop and the current goes say around like that. That's the current I at every point all the way around. Now in this current carrying loop we're going to uh, set it up in such a way we're going to mount wires here that come off in this direction and come off in this direction. Now those wires are not grounded they're not connected to anything so these are just kind of hanging out there they really do not carry the current at all but these wires or these uh, you could think of those as metal rods in fact you can even think of this whole thing as a stiff metal rod it's not going to change its shape at all but because of the way that we've got these pivot points set up here uh, the entire loop can rotate inside the region of a magnetic field so you can think of that as being able to spin one way or the other all right well let's think of the forces that are acting now now let's talk about the forces on each of these individual sides so let's call this side one here this bottom will be side two over here this is side three and up here is side four like that these sides are going to experience a force now if the loop is in the plane of the paper and the magnetic field is going in that region right there then there's going to be forces on some sides but not the others for example here on side two you'll see the current is to the right the magnetic field is to the right and then the force which is F equals I L cross B since L is to the right and in the same direction as the magnetic field then the angle between L and B is zero so there's no force on uh, side two when it's in this orientation and the same with side four it's in the opposite direction so the sign term whenever you figure out the magnitude of F it's going to be I L B times the sine of the angle because the angle for side two is zero and the angle for side four is you know 180 degrees that's going to give you a sign that is zero in both of those cases however if it turns slightly then think about what happens with side two and side four for side two and side four if this were turned just a little bit maybe an angle like that then the angle is L cross B now you see there's going to be a bit of a force and that force is going to point that way and up here it'll point that way and that'll be true until it comes around here okay so no matter let, let's see is it true that no matter the orientation uh, that the force is always going to be pointed down like that so these two forces right here are equal in magnitude opposite in direction so those two forces cancel each other so there's going to be no up down motion here as this thing rotates well what about sides one and three then well the way that it's oriented right here side one think about the right hand rule uh, i l cross b that's going to have a force that's up out of the plane of the paper so we'll draw that as a dot right there and side three I L cross B that's going to have a force that is into the paper like that so these two forces right here actually work in such a way to cause this thing to rotate like that 
Now, we promised that we were going to talk about torque here, uh, but let's kind of look at this from a different perspective here. Maybe we will look at it from the top and, and maybe look at it from about uh, three or four different perspectives here, and I think it'll make more sense as to what's going on here. Let's start, we're, we're doing a top view here. Here's the magnetic field again. And this time, let's show the orientation this way. Let's say there's the loop, and we're looking at it from above. So this end of the loop uh, and this end of the loop, you're looking down these long sides here. You're looking uh, down one side one and side three and four is across the top here. Okay, well, if we think of this as, this will be the one that's coming out, current that's coming out. This will be the current that's going in. So across the top, the current is going in that direction from here around to there. All right, this, uh, this then, let's think about that. The current that is coming upward is side three. The current that is going downward is side one if we're looking at it from above. So this side here is side three, and this side over here is side one, and then the top is uh, side four. But we won't, we're, we're unconcerned about those two now because we've decided that those uh, sides one, I'm sorry, sides two and four cancel each other. So we're really concentrating now on sides one and three. All right, when it's in this position right here, then use your right hand rule and look at the direction for sides one and three. I, L, cross B, there's going to be a force in that direction. That's F3. And then down here, I cross B, there's going to be a force in that direction. So this represents then uh, an equilibrium position because once the forces are lined up that way, the thing's no longer going to want to rotate. Uh, because the two sides are pulling each other and we have no more rotation. So this point right here, that would be the point of rotation in the center. So this setup right here, this orientation represents then a, um, a, a, an equilibrium position. Let's just call it that. But let's say that we rotate it just a little bit. So we're going just slightly to the side here. Let's do that. We'll draw that one. And now we'll put it like this, let's say. Okay, then this is still end one, this is still end three. So there's three currents coming out. This is one currents going in, like that. And now what are the directions of uh, uh, the pivot point here? What are the directions on sides one and three? I, L, cross B, still a force in that direction. So that's F3, and this is F1. And you can see what's going to happen here. If it's in this position, it's going to want to snap back to its equilibrium position here. So it wants to go in that direction there. All right, let's do another one. Let's, uh, say, let's say that we've got it uh, oriented uh, with the magnetic field. So this is still side, one, uh, side three coming out, and this is side one like that. Well, now what direction? R cross B. Now it's still in that direction. So that's F3. And since that's in to the board, I L cross B forces in that direction. Okay, and that's great, but let's make it go a little bit farther just so we can see what's going on there. So now it's oriented in this direction like that. This is still where the current's coming out of the page, so that's still side three there. This is still side one with the current going in. And now, what about it? Oh, cross B, still up in that direction. And this, L cross B, still down in that direction. 
So you can see the direction of F3 in all of these cases is the same. The same with F1. F1 is always pointed in exactly the same way. And you can even imagine uh, one more orientation here where it's completely turned around so that now we've got uh, three down here and we've got one up here. And now uh, the force for three is along this axis and the force for this one is in the opposite direction there. So that's F1, this is F3, and you can see that they're opposing each other there. Now this also, technically speaking, is an equilibrium position if it could maintain that position right there. But unlike this equilibrium in the upper corner here, this, uh, this equilibrium position, this equilibrium position is a stable equilibrium position. However, this equilibrium position is unstable because if it just moves slightly, then it's going to flip around. It flips around in such a way that, you know, it does this sort of thing. Uh, that it's going to try to get back to this orientation, something like that. So it, if it's just, just a little bit off, rather than it snapping back to this orientation, it tries to get to this one. So if it's in this one and you move it a little bit, well, it snaps back to this orientation here. So we call this a stable orientation, and this one down here would be unstable orientation. But looking at it from this perspective, you can kind of see what's going on here. There's going to be a torque. If I have it in this position, there's going to be a torque around to this position here. All right, so if we're interested in torque here, then this is the moment arm right here, and then this is the force being applied here. So the distance between the pivot point and the point where the force is applied is B over 2. So that'll be our R when we calculate torque. Torque itself is R cross F. Okay. And uh, that means that the magnitude of the torque is going to be R times F times the sine of the angle between the two. All right, the R is B over 2. The F is I A big B and multiplied by the sine of the angle between the two, like that. All right, that's the torque on one end here. Say we've taken care of the top portion, let's say. Now the bottom portion is also a torque and it adds to the, the same motion, so we'll just add that in as well. So this is going to be plus B over 2 I A big B sine of theta. So we've got two of those. When we add these together, we end up with I times A times little b times big B times the sine of theta, like that. So that's the torque on a single loop uh, of wire inside the magnetic field. And that's exactly the situation that we have here. We have a single loop of wire. Now, if we had done something like this, if we had put a second loop on top of that, or a third loop on top of that, each one of those loops then is going to contribute to the torque. Now, practically speaking, those would have to be insulated wires so that they're not touching each other, they're not electrically in contact with each other, but they form multiple loops right on top of each other. And we can symbolize that, the addition of loops, just by adding in a number n, where n represents the number of loops here. Now I'm going to rearrange the terms here, n, i, uh, and this a, b, that's the cross-sectional area of the loop here. We can symbolize that is it's A times B. That's this area of the loop here. We'll symbolize that as an area vector now. So the area vector uh, is going to be A, and its magnitude is just A times B, but the direction of it is going to be normal to the surface. So in this orientation, it points upward like that. If we look at a different orientation, say right here, then 
the area vector points that way or the area vector points that way. And this A times B is the area vector times B times sine of theta. There. All right, now we're going to define a term here. We're going to define uh, mu as a vector, and it is n times i times a. The n i a, in this case, this is called the magnetic dipole moment. You may recall something similar whenever we were talking about uh, electric dipoles. We had an electric dipole moment and we called it P. Well, this is the magnetic dipole moment and symbolized by mu. So this is NIA, and this would be the magnitude of A in this equation here. Uh, this is going to be the magnitude of mu times B times the sine of theta. Okay, since each of these, b and mu, are now vectors, and mu points in the same direction as a, then this mu points in the same direction as a here, then we have these two vectors, and this sine of theta is the angle between these two vectors then. So let's write it this way. Tau is mu cross and there we have the equation for the torque of a loop of wire inside a magnetic field. And it's a current carrying loop of wire which behaves like a magnetic dipole. In the next chapter, in the next section, we'll talk about why that is the case. But it is indeed the case that a loop of current carrying wire behaves like a magnetic dipole, uh, which is, you know, if you've thought about it, it's an electromagnet. Uh, but it has a magnetic dipole moment of mu, put it in the external magnetic field, and it's going to create a torque, which is given by tau. All right, now, just to complete uh, the analogy that we had last time, uh, for electric dipoles, we had tau equals P cross E. Now, that was for electric dipoles, and hopefully that's review. Uh, you may also remember that we had the potential energy for an electric dipole. U of theta is equal to minus P dot E. All right, so without derivation uh, and by analogy here, we can say this is for electric dipole, that th there's a certain amount of energy as you rotate the dipole around uh, based upon its position. There may be stored potential energy, and that's what this is, that the potential energy depends upon the orientation theta. This is for electrical dipoles, but for magnetic dipoles, we have something similar. And without derivation and just by analogy, we're going to say this is minus mu dot b. So there is the amount of potential energy that can be stored in a magnetic dipole that is, has a certain orientation theta within that magnetic field. So we're gonna say that we have uh, 250 loops. And uh, we've got a, an area vector A that is 2.52 times 10 to the negative four square meters. Now the shape doesn't really matter that much. What matters is the area. We drew our original one as a rectangular loop. It could be a circular loop. The area is what matters. All right, uh, let's say it's carrying a current, I, that is uh, 100 microamps, so a small amount of current, and it's in a magnetic field that is 0 0.85 Tesla. All right, how much energy is required then to turn the coil from end to end? So delta U, that's the amount of energy change going from one end to the other, is equal to U at 180 degrees minus U at zero degrees. So we're rotating it from end to end. That means that this is gonna be minus mu B times the cosine of 180 degrees. Remember, it's a dot product. 
uh, we're dealing with this equation here. So it is a dot product and the magnitude is going to be mu times b times the cosine of the angle between the two. That's where this came from. Minus negative mu b times the cosine of zero degrees. There. Okay, the negatives cancel uh, here and uh, you end up with B, and also this is a negative as well, so it cancels that. So you're going to end up with mu b from this first term plus mu b from the second term is going to be 2 mu b. All right, so that's the amount of energy that has changed when we rotate this dipole from end to end. Uh, mu is in i a, so this is going to be 2 times n i a b. A is the area up here. I we've got, n we've got, b we've got. So we can plug in our numbers here to figure out what delta u is now. It's going to be 2 times 250 loops times 100 times 10 to the negative 6 amps times A, and A is 2.52 times 10 to the negative 4 square meters times B of 0 0.85 Tesla. All right, it's time to do a calculation. And it turns out to be 1.07 times 10 to the negative fifth joules. So there's our answer. That's uh, the amount of energy required to rotate it from end to end then. All right, so we're finished talking about that. Let's, uh, let's go back to our original picture here. And you notice that this is equilibrium position, but if we take that uh, wire loop and we rotate it around to say this position here, then in that position there, there is stored energy. Perhaps it required some energy for us to rotate it, but there is stored energy in this position right here. Now that energy can be released then if we let go of it and it snaps back to this position here. And we just saw that how much energy is uh, required to rotate it or how much energy is released going from this position to that position. Well, uh, if you'll think about this, this would be a very useful device here if we could figure out how to do something like this, put it in this position, let it go, and then when it gets in this position here, to suddenly switch the direction of the current. Because if the direction of the currents were switched here, in other words, if three was going into the page and I would, uh, one was coming out of the page, then we would have this position again. And then it would flip to this position. And then if we could switch the direction of the currents one more time, we would go back to this. So we could create a rotating machine here if we figure out a way to switch the currents at just the right point in time here when it's in that position. Because if we did this, here, here's what would happen. It'll start in that position, it'll rotate to this position, but as it's rotating, the momentum is gonna carry it past the equilibrium position just a little bit. Now, if the current stayed in these current orientations, here's what would happen. If it started this way, it would go like this, go past the equilibrium position, but it would very quickly settle down back to the equilibrium position. But if we switch the currents at just the right time when it's in that position, here's what would happen. It starts here and now it rotates around. Let's say, where does it rotate? It rotates around in this direction, back to the equilibrium position, but it goes past the equilibrium position a little bit. And now we've switched the direction of the current so it continues on switch the direction of the currents, continues on. Switch the direction of the current, it continues on. Okay, well, there is a way to do that through something called uh, a commutator. And probably the simplest type of commutator that switches the, uh, the current directions. And the easiest one to understand, I think, is a split ring commutator. So let me show you in this uh, drawing here. Um, this down here, that little 
stubby cylinder. That's the split ring commutator. And it's called a split ring because it's got this split in the middle here. So you can think of that as a, a little sh short cylinder, uh, but it's got, uh, let's say, an insulator between. So the right half is isolated electrically from the left half. So they're insulated from each other. Now, these little blocks here that are on the side that are touching it are just there to make contact with the, this split ring. Uh, and you see they're carrying current. So these two ends are connected up to, say, a battery then. So the current is coming in, goes through, makes contact with the split ring. And then because the split ring is connected to this loop, you'll see here's a loop of wire. Then the current goes up this way, round that way, round that way, and down this way, and then back to this half of the split ring, and then back to the battery here. Also notice there's a magnet here. This is the north end of a, one magnet. This is the south end of another magnet. So we've got a magnetic field in this region going from north side to south side. So the magnetic field would be directed from north to south here. I won't draw in the magnetic field lines here, though. Uh, now, this orientation, the way that it's drawn here, is exactly what we had originally. It's in the plane of the sheet of paper here. The magnetic field is going in one direction like that. So, looking here, then over here on this side, there's going to be a force act upon this side. And you can use the right-hand rule, I, L, cross B. There's going to be a force upward in that direction on that side. Over here on this side, then there's going to be I, L, cross B. There's going to be a downward force like that. So this thing is going to want to rotate here. And as it rotates, notice what's going to happen. On this side, the left side of the split ring, the current is going in. And as it rotates, then this whole ring rotates as well. And now, as it rotates, this side comes in contact with this side. And now suddenly, the current which was going in on this side is now coming out on this side. So we've reversed the directions of the current throughout this whole loop at just the right time then, so that the rotation can continue. This, by the way, is a very simple type of uh, motor. This is a simple DC motor. And you can imagine what could happen if we uh, had uh, maybe a, an axle coming off here and we could put a, a wheel somehow on that. And now we could spin this wheel around and we could maybe get some energy off of that. We could attach it to a little race car uh, wheel and maybe drive the race car, something like that. So you can see you can get some potential work out of this uh, just by switching the currents at just the right time through a split ring commutator like that. Now, this is the basis for every type of motor, that there's an interaction between the current and the magnetic field, which allows some type of rotation to occur. Typical motors that you'll find in your house and you know anything that requires a motor is going to be a lot more complicated than this. Uh, nevertheless, this is the basic idea of all motors, that you have an interaction of the magnetic fields and the currents to cause some rotation there. All right, we'll stop here uh, right now, and we'll continue on with magnetic fields from a slightly different perspective next time.